तस भगवत अर्हत समुतसा नमो तस भगवत अर्हत समुतसा नमो तस भगवत अर्हत समुतसा People talk about enlightenment as being the goal of the path. It's worth thinking about what that means. The first thing to say is that the English word enlightenment is a kind of a oddity. It's, it's, it's an odd choice because it doesn't really directly translate anything from the Pali Although there is an association with light as a um, the mind being luminous, there's uh, one of the characteristics of the enlightened mind is a, a, a loco, the light opens, but it's generally not uh, not used as the uh, the name of the experience. <sighs> common commonly uh, common words that, that are used to express it in, in the Pali are uh, vimuti and bodhi vimuti means liberation it literally means uh, the breaking of chains or fetters we is prefix meaning to to cut or to sever and muti are chains or bonds So this, uh, this implies that before the experience of vimuti or enlightenment, uh, we are in bondage, we are not free. Before the mind is, is uh, liberated, it remains in bondage to the, to the desires, to the fears, basically to the world of a sensory experience is fettered by pain and pleasure. One of the common sequences that's talked about in, in terms of mental states leading up to enlightenment is Nibhita uh, Viraga uh, Nibhita Viraga Niroda Vimuti. Nibhita is uh, the sense of dissolution or disenchantment. It's, it's a sense of um, enough, enough of this. The Buddha uses the, 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 the Pali word alang. It's a bit stronger than the English enough. It's like, you know, I've had enough, that's it. Uh, he talks about um, the cycle of rebirth. He, he says that he, there's a series of suttas, short suttas in the Samyutta Nikaya where he talks about uh, all the, um, the length of time we've spent wandering in samsara and he uses some very strong images could pile up all the skulls you've left behind, it would be a mountain the size of, of the Himalayas. If you could uh, gather together all the blood you've shed, it would be greater than the great ocean. And at the end of each of these metaphors, and there's about a half a dozen of them, all of that same kind of spirit, at the end of each one he says, Alang, Alang, you should, you should think Alang, Enough. How long am I going to keep filling the cemeteries? So uh, nibida is, um, is when in that sense of disillusion, disenchantment with the process of samsara, and that leads to uh, viraga, which is this passion. Passion or raga is um, kind of the 
energy, the, the motive power that drives the, the motor of samsara. It's like the electricity that drives the motor, the passion for existence, and the passion for sense experience. And once uh, you really felt along enough, then the passion goes away. There's no more engine to the motor. But as you um, can see, uh, in, if you have a, like, uh, you're driving your car, and um, if you were if you were to uh, take your uh, take your foot off the gas, or put the and put it in neutral, it would continue to to go forward for some time. If you don't hit the brake, it'll just it'll peter out. It'll run out. That's what happens with the samsaric process. Once you stop feeding it, it still continues for some time running down, it's kind of inertia. Then the final ending of the process is Naroda. That's when um, the samsaric process ends. That means cessation. The process terminates, it's over, it ceases. also one of the meanings of uh, nibbana or nirvana is blowing out. It's the literal meaning, it's blowing out, blowing out of the process. So the word nibbana comes from a verb, nibeti, which means to snuff out or to blow out. So if you were to use that, and nibbana is a past participle, if you were to use that word in a mundane manner, like a non-technical, non-Buddhist manner, just conversational, Polly, uh, if if us, if uh, we leave this room and um, uh, I I'm, I want to make sure the candles are out, so I ask somebody, are the candles are the candles out? Uh, someone might say yes, they are nibbana. You know, they are snuffed out. <coughs> And then Vimuti is like the result of that. Vimuti is liberation. The mind is liberated. It's no longer bound to the process. It's free. Another uh, word that's used is Bodhi, which literally means in light, um, awakened. So the, the word Buddha is title of, comes from that same root. The Buddha is the awakened one, the one who is awakened. So this implies that before enlightenment we're all partially asleep, more or less asleep. We're delusional like we're dreaming. We're not experiencing things in a fully clear awake manner. Wakefulness is um, really the uh, kind of uh, guiding principle of, of, of practice to try and become more awake. This is what uh, mindfulness is, sati, is uh, developing, is remembering to be present. <coughs> when you uh, remember to be present, then you're fully awake. You're, you know, uh, otherwise, you're don't have sati, you're kind of sleepwalking. You can go through the motions of life, but you're not really fully experiencing anything. You know, you're half asleep. You're just kind of sleepwalking. Kind of, kind of a robotic existence. And we can have, uh, prior to the moment of actual enlightenment, can have small moments of Bodhi. We have them all the time. One that Ajahn Sumedho uh, talks about a fair bit is if you're meditating and your mind is wandered, you're drifting, you're daydreaming, you're just lost, and then you suddenly remember, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be paying attention here. You come back to your practice. You know, don't become upset with yourself because you've it off. You know, rejoice
voice that you've awakened to the reality. You know, and you, this is a small moment of Bodhi. Ah, oh, yeah, right. Here I am. In the Zen tradition, they talk about little Satori and big Satori. Well, big Satori is what we would call actual enlightenment, but little Satori are you know, experiences along the way where you have a, a real experience of clarity. You know, the, 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 the light bulb goes on, the, the, you know, the clouds part. And you go, oh yeah, right. That's, that's how it is. And those are quite valuable. You should recognize them when they occur. And, uh, cherish them. Uh, sp <coughs> speaking about Zen tradition, there, there is also um, a long-standing uh, controversy between the different schools of Zen, in, uh, based on what they call s gradual enlightenment and sudden enlightenment. And I think in the um, in the Pali tradition, in Theravada Buddhism, it's kind of like both. Uh, because like many things in life, many processes, it's little by little and then all at once. You know, little by little and all at once. You know, uh, somebody uh, made an analogy. I forget, I forget who came up with this. It's like a modern person come up with this analogy. It's like you've got a, a dam holding back uh, water and you're digging into it with a shovel. And every single shovel fill, shovel full is the same, it takes the same effort, there's the same amount of dirt. But it's only the last one that has the result that the water comes rushing through. And the Buddhists compared process to uh, uh, the deep ocean. He said if you walk out into the deep ocean, you're walking from the shore, it slopes down gradually, the water comes, comes, up, comes up your body gradually. You know, but there is some point, you've taken one more step and you're underwater. So there is a definite, um, there is a definite moment, there is a, there is a, uh, a definite change. In the Abhidhamma, they talk about it's another term or set of terms that are used. They talk about it as Maga Pala. Maga is path and Pala is fruit. And in the <clears throat> Abhidhamma texts, whenever they talk about what we call enlightenment or the enlightenment moment, to as Magapala because it does occur in a kind of one-two uh, process. Maga, the path, is the last um, comically effective moment in the series. And it's called path because at that moment, the eight path factors, path, the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, they come together in perfection and at a, a super mundane level, a locutural level, super mundane or transcendental level, meaning they're all aligned to Nibbana, they're aligned to the unconditioned. So the view, the speech, in this case meaning Vitaka Vichara, the, um, the thoughts, the, all the eight path, path, path factors take Nibbana as their object. They align to Nibbana. And this then brings forth the fruit moment, the Pala. 
Impala in the mundane sense just means a fruit, like an apple or a mango, but here is the fruit or the result. And it's a resultant, a comically resultant moment. The result of the comma made by path moment. And one, uh, having had all the eight path factors aligned to Nibbana, then one enters Nibbana or experiences Nibbana. And that causes a, a fundamental change in the depth of the person. It's like a turning around, a realignment, turning 180 degrees in the depth. And once having glimpsed Nibbana, that, that person is never, never goes back from that. It's never, it, it makes a permanent change. And we call that first encounter with the unconditioned, we call that the sotapanna or stream entry. And that could be just a, a glimpse. It's like the, per, the curtains part for just a moment. And the person knows, ah, there is an unconditioned. <clears throat> but it's not yet fully understood. There's still work to do. There's three more stages of enlightenment. And the final one is Arahant, in which there's a total penetration, a total immersion into the unconditioned. And the person is perfected. No defilements remain. The, uh, no shadow in the psyche remains. It's a complete purification. Prior to the experience of stream entry, one cannot really know or imagine what is the unconditioned, what is, what is the experience. But one can approach closer and closer to it to make the final leap shorter and easier. It's like a mathematical asymptote, if you know what that is. If you have a, if you graph an equation, like let's say a real simple one would be say uh, uh, y equals 1 over x. Uh, the x, the, the, the line of the graph will get closer and closer to the zero axis, but it never reaches it. If uh, y equals two, then x, or if x equals two, then y equals um, one half. If x equals a thousand, y equals one over a thousand. And no matter how big you make uh, x, y gets smaller and smaller, infinitesimally small, but it never reaches zero. And that's like approaching, approaching uh, an understanding of emptiness and of the unconditioned before making that final immersion. And we, <clears throat> we try and do that primarily by um, uh, clear seeing. That's the meaning of Vipassana, is clear seeing. And we talk about and think about Vipassana as a meditation, and that's not really wrong. It, it, there are meditation methods we call Vipassana. There's more than one. But Vipassana is actually a state of mind that the meditation is trying to access. It's a state of mind of clear seeing, meaning that the process of samsara is seen without a filter. The mind is knowing each subsequent moment. It's knowing the object of consciousness clearly. And that's difficult to do. It's a challenging practice. 
it's difficult because we're caught all the time by the objects. We get uh, lost in them. Uh, objects can arise that have some emotional resonance, old memories or fears, you know, and then, then the mind gets kind of lost, caught. And these are the kind of the, the two things that the, the enemies of clear seeing are fear and fascination. We're either afraid of something and, and we recoil from it or we're fascinated by it and we go into it. Whereas the clear seeing is just objectively observing the phenomena as they arise without taking ownership of it without being moved by it. In the sequence of mental states that I mentioned earlier, in Nibida, Viraga, Niroda, Vimuti, the one before that sequence is uh, Yetabhuta Nanadasana, the knowledge and vision of things as they are which means seeing things according to reality. So when we see things according to reality as they actually are, that leads to that, that feeling of enough. You know, what's, the, what's the point of this? Now, samsara is endlessly catching us process of samsara, which means wandering in circles, basically. It's constantly caught in it, and it's by being caught in samsara that we don't see nibbana. Samsara is, in a sense, it's, it's not a, a, a place or a, a thing. It's, it's something we do. It's an action we do. We choose moment by moment to engage in samsara caught in that process. So it takes a lot of unraveling to get out of that. Other ways that the Buddha speaks about the enlightened mind, not so much the process but the, or the moment, but the actual experience light and mind. Uh, he commonly uses the analogy of in different little different forms of the of clear water. He says it's like a man looking into a pool filled with crystal clear water. And uh, there's no obstruction to his vision. He can see the pebbles at the bottom and he, he can see fish going to and fro. And the mind is, is that clear. It's not obstructing anything. There's no obstruction. It's one of the um, uh, commonly used uh, characteristics of the enlightened mind used in Hawaiian Buddhism is non-obstruction. There's no, no blockage, no obstruction. Tibetan Buddhism, they talk about the clear blue sky. And the clouds are the obstructions, they're the defilements. And even on a cloudy day, the blue sky is still present, but we don't see it because it's hidden by the, the clouds. It's like our enlightened mind is intrinsic to us, it's natural to us, it's not something beyond from out there. don't see it because it's hidden by the defilements. So there's another Zen saying is all beings are Buddhas from beginningless time. The implication there is you know, you're, you're already a Buddha but you don't know it. The Buddha didn't talk a lot about uh, the 
Nibbana or the unconditioned or the enlightened mind uh, for the very reason that it, uh, the actual essence of it cannot be expressed in words. And it's, it was, uh, his teaching was always practical, oriented to getting people to that point. And endless descriptions would just be misleading because the words are always a bit off. But one of the, um, the most uh, deepest expositions that he gives is a verse that occurs in a couple of places, one in the Digha Nikaya, one in the Majima Nikaya, uh, where he describes the liberated mind in verse. And the verse is rather cryptic, and it's, uh, you see the uh, different translators, Bodhi and uh, Walsh, footnotes to their translations are long, you know, trying to justify their choice of words. It is a bit obscure, but the, um, the most likely meaning is that uh, one of the characteristics is pavasara, <coughs> which the straightforward meaning of that is uh, luminous or brilliant. Again, the allusion to light. That, uh, the enlightened mind is, is brilliant. As is saying in the Gutra uh, Nikaya that uh, the chitta is inherently luminous. There, the, the word used is abasara. The chitta is inherently luminous, meaning consciousness is, is inherently bright. You know, so the enlightened mind, that brightness is, is non uh, obstructed. Another uh, epithet in that verse is uh, boundless, anantara, without boundary. Well, there's no limit to it. This is, again, vimuti, liberated. The mind is not bound by conditions. It's, it's, so it's boundless. You know, it's not confined or defined. It's unlimited. And the third characteristic is uh, the one that's the most difficult to translate, but a literal meaning would be it finds no footing, meaning it, you know, it has no basis, it's not dependent on anything. And this uh, reminds, uh, reminds us of um, one of the common uh, words used for Nibbana is asankata, the unconditioned. Samsara is sankata, conditioned. It's one of the principles of um, Buddhist philosophy is that everything in the samsaric world is conditioned, meaning it arises from causes and not randomly, not otherwise. Things only arise due to causes and conditions. But Nibbana is without cause or condition. It's unconditioned. is as it is. If we could use even that's misleading, to say is implies a kind of existence, and it's beyond existence or non-existence. So the, um, to kind of, uh, leave you with the main practical point. The, um, the, the speculating about what uh, enlightenment is before one experiences it is not very useful. It's, you're, you're never going to get it right in your imagination. It's always somehow more and somehow less than what you imagined. But um, Uh, you can approach approach it step by step with clear seeing and with uh, uh, non-attachment, with renunciation, with letting go. You know? And that's the process for uh, realizing that that uh, uh, that liberation.
inflammation that are weakening on the path and the food. Thank you.